I'm going to ask him to come through. Okay, are you guys ready to start? Sorry we had to wait a couple more minutes, but we just wanted to make sure that um, everyone who RSVP is here. Apparently not, but that's okay, we're going to get started. So thank you all for uh, coming to a gentle introduction to machine learning. This presentation is part of AI for Everyone, which is an initiative to introduce more students to artificial intelligence. Let me start with a quick introduction. My name is Andres Barakis, and I'm a computer science major here at UCI. And for the past year or so, I've been focusing on machine learning. And although I've explored many different topics, the two of the topics that have caught my attention are natural language processing and generative adversarial networks. So I'll talk a little bit about those later through the presentation. Um, and if you guys want to connect with me, feel free to send me a message through LinkedIn. Uh, on Twitter, I'm always posting machine uh, learning related content. So if you want to check that out, feel free. Now let's uh, see an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to start with the motivation for AI. So just a little history of what um, of artificial intelligence. And then we'll talk about the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning. Then we'll go into some examples that you've probably seen in, in technology uh, for machine learning. And then we'll explore machine learning in a little bit more detail uh, just by giving you some more examples related to data and algorithms. Towards the end, um, I'm going to do a quick demo. And if you guys have questions, we're going to do a Q&A. Okay? And by the way, I'm going to try to share this with you guys because at the end of this presentation, there's uh, the sources that I use to put all this together. And I think that's really good uh, information for you guys to read if you're interested in learning more about machine learning. So let's get started. So for thousands of years, humans have been curious about how human intelligence works, right? How is it that something that is not tangible is able to affect the world around us? The field of artificial intelligence tries to go one step farther. It tries to create intelligent entities. Now, what exactly do we mean by uh, intelligent entities? Well, I don't know if you have that ex this experience, but if you go and ask someone what artificial intelligence is, you're most likely going to get different answers, right? So, if you go to someone at uh, go up to someone at Facebook um, versus someone at Google, you're most likely going to get different answers about like what artificial intelligence is. And the reason for this is, for the past couple of years, uh, researchers have approached machine learning and artificial intelligence from different, uh, uh, have taken different approaches to artificial intelligence. So in this chart, I have four of those different approaches. We have thinking humanly, thinking rationally, acting humanly, and acting rationally. Now, the only one that we're going to focus on in this presentation is acting rationally, because um, that is what most researchers are actually focusing on. So, now, going back to the question of what is um, intelligent entities? Well, if we take the acting rationally approach, what we're trying to create is a rational agent that is able to take actions so as to achieve the best outcome. Okay? So I'm going to give some examples of that. Um, but before I do that, let me just give you um, an idea of some of the disciplines that have uh, contributed viewpoints and techniques to artificial intelligence. So we have philosophy, mathematics, uh, linguistics, psychology. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because AI is actually a multidisciplinary field. So you don't have to be a computer scientist or an engineer to uh, you know, try to learn AI or, or make an impact in artificial intelligence. <coughs> All of these fields have made an impact in, in artificial intelligence. So there's a lot to it. And that is why um, sometimes there's a lot of debate, not just about the algorithms of AI, but also about the ethics, or different techniques that we could use to improve it. So now, what is the difference between AI and machine learning? Well, machine learning is just an approach to artificial intelligence. So I want you to think of it as just a subfield of AI. And the reason I bring this up is because if you read articles or watch the news, a lot of times uh, people tend to use artificial intelligence and machine learning interchangeably when they're not. Okay? So machine learning is just a subfield of AI. Now, to go in a little bit more detail, machine learning is concerned with making predictions or decisions. It is also concerned with getting better with experience. And in parentheses, I added data, because experience is actually to humans what data is to computers. And it is also concerned with solving problems whose solutions are uh, difficult to describe. And we'll see that in some examples. So these are things that you most likely seen 
uh, on the internet <coughs> or you've read about in articles. My favorite, uh, Netflix. So how is it that Netflix is using machine learning uh, to improve its services? Well, if you pay attention to the thumbnail right here uh, for Stranger Things, and if you pay attention to the text in green, you'll see 98% match. So what that means is they have um, taken data from the user, and in this uh, example, I'm actually the user. That's a, a screenshot of my uh, profile on Netflix. And they have suggested Stranger Things to me based on my um, habits on Netflix, right? So based on what kind of movies I watch, in what categories, for how long I watch them for, uh, maybe if I thumbed up a movie or I didn't like something. And what's impressive is that they are almost 100% sure that I'm going to like Stranger Things, which is actually right. Um, so... That is pretty cool stuff, and they're using basically just the data that I'm um, inputting through my interactions with Netflix to make this kind of predictions. Another one that I think is pretty cool and is very recent, and you've probably noticed if you use uh, Gmail, is the reply suggestions. So what they're doing is they're using natural language processing to understand the emails, right? And not only that, but they are trying to understand the context um, so well so that they can uh, that they can actually create replies um, and this is really cool because if you read the replies it doesn't seem like it came from a computer it, seem, it seems like it came from the actual user um, and I think this is amazing just because if Google is already reading our emails they might as well just give us something cool to play with right so some other examples Google Maps uh, we all know that they use or uh, hopefully you guys know that they use machine learning to figure out the best destination for, uh, you know, the best destination or best route. But something that is pretty new and I'm sure you, have, you guys have noticed is the parking predictions. So what they're doing now is imagine you arrive to your destination. <coughs> Instead of just stopping there, you start circling the area for five, ten minutes. So this might be an indication that you're looking for parking. And what they're doing now is they're taking all this data from different users and they're telling us their best predictions of how bad or how good they think parking is going to be at a, diff at a specific location. Another good example is uh, spam filters. So whether an email is, uh, is spam or not, mobile check deposits to uh, read the text or the numbers on, mo on checks. Facebook recognition <laughs> uses machine learning to recognize faces. It doesn't do it too well, but um, you know it's there. Amazon recommendations, actually you guys have seen that before. So if you buy a book, um, they're, right away they're going to throw you, throw you another book that is most likely in the same category or that other users have bought um, because they think that you're going to be interested. And then one of my favorites is voice to text. This one is really cool because voice to text might seem like an easy task to do just because you might think, well, all you need to do is just match a certain noise or a certain sound to a text but there's a lot more to it, right? So imagine that you are in a noisy area and you're speaking to Google Translate. So they have to filter out all that noise in order to understand what the user is actually saying. Um, in, addition is, in addition, you have to think about like accents or how fast or how slow the person is, is talking. So all those things need to be taken into account when you're trying to go from voice to text. Now, let's explore machine learning in more detail. And before I go into the main example for this presentation, I just want you to understand one thing. Machine learning is just about feeding data into generic algorithms, okay? Now, I've underlined data and algorithms because those are two big parts of machine learning. And I'm gonna try to describe what we mean by generic algorithms and what kind of data we're talking about here. So now, imagine that you have this classification problem, okay? <clears throat> And then we're using a generic algorithm like I said before. Well, imagine that you take all this data, and in this situation, data is going to be emails, right? Imagine you're just taking all your emails from your Gmail account. And you're passing it through a generic machine learning algorithm that does classification. Well, what I'm going to get in return as an output is whether my email is spam or not. So very simple. Now, the reason this is called a generic algorithm is because if I just use that same algorithm but, take, but give it different data, let's say that I pass images of handwritten numbers instead of emails. 
Well, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to classify that data. But in this situation, since I'm passing it images of handwritten numbers, it's going to tell me whether uh, if an image is a 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Okay? So that's what we mean by generic algorithms. Because in machine learning, what's more important is the data. The data matters a lot. The quality of the data, the quantity of the data. Um, of course, the algorithms matter too, but if you have good data, you're going to get good results, most likely. Now, let's talk about data. For now, I want you to think of um, algorithms as falling into two main categories in machine learning. Okay? There are more, but just think of them as two categories, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So let's go into uh, supervised. Imagine you are a real estate agent, and you hire some trainees. Now the problem is you have lots of years of experience, and you can go up to a house and look at maybe the number of bedrooms of the house, the square footage, the neighborhood, and you can get a pretty good estimate of how much a house sells for, right? Because of your years of experience. But your trainees don't have that kind of experience. So you think to yourself, what if I create a program that is able to take all this information about a house and estimate a price? Okay, so let's, let's try to solve that problem. Let's see. So I'm gonna use something like um, a generic algorithm like I mentioned before. And I'm going to try to pass all of this information uh, to my generic algorithm. Now, let's say that for many months, I collect a lot of data. Okay, So a lot of data of different houses. And I'm not just talking about hundreds of houses, but I'm talking about thousands or even hundreds of thousands of houses. And then I'm going to use this data to train my algorithm. Because I have to teach it how, what the different patterns are between bedroom, square footage, neighborhood, and the final sales price. Okay? So after I collected all this data, now I'm going to give it a problem. Tell me, based on this information, what the sales price of a house is. Okay? So what I showed you before is called training data. And this is all the data that I'm going to pass to my algorithm so it can learn the patterns between the features, which are the bedroom, square footage, neighborhood, and my uh, output, which is my Y, the sales price. Now, the actual problem is going to be using test data. So let's look into that. So once I um, actually pass in my test data, I have to think about, well, did I create a logical base for how all this information is related, right? And it is easy to do that when you have labels. And when we're talking about supervised learning, the labels are actually my sales price. It's like I already know the answer before I even try to solve the problem. Okay? So that is what uh, supervised learning is. We have the x's and we have the upward y. But now imagine um, this situation where we're giving this data, the bedrooms, square footage, uh, the neighborhood, but we're not giving a label, y. And this is actually called unsupervised learning. Now I'm going to ask you guys, if we don't have the label, why do you guys think that this is such, actually such an important topic as supervised learning? Why, is, why can we still do something with this data even though we don't have that why at the end? Can someone take a guess? No idea? Well, okay, so think about this. In the first example in supervised learning, I had someone with lots of experience, right? This realtor who who has worked for many years and can look at a house and give me a sales price. And he, he has sat down and write down all of this data for us. But in the real world, we don't always have these experts labeling the data. If you go into YouTube and you read the comments, the comments are not organized in any way. They're not labeled. We don't know if a comment is positive. We don't know if a comment is talking about news or they're just trolling. There's no label to that data. But we still want to do something with it because there's a lot of it. This, that's actually how the real world works. There's a lot of data and it's not labeled and it's unorganized. So unsupervised learning is very important because, again, we have a lot of that data. So we need to know, we need to do something with it. So in this situation, since we're not really trying to predict the house because we can't really train it to do that, 
we can still look at this and find patterns. Maybe we uh, find out that the neighborhood matters a lot, uh, or that in certain neighborhoods we have bigger houses, and we can use this as a marketing tool, right? So we're not using it as, as a prediction tool, but we can use it for something else, just to get more insight about the data. Now, I'm gonna show you an example of how we can do classification. Um, and have you guys heard of neural networks? Raise your hand. Do you guys know what a neural network is? Yeah. Okay. It's okay if you don't know because it's actually a very difficult topic, and uh, that's actually another presentation that I that I'm doing uh, introduction to neural networks. But um, let's just keep the problem simple. We're gonna try to do classification like I showed you in one of the examples earlier. Imagine we have this data set. Now, this is called, in, uh, if you want to look it up, it's called the MNIST <laughs> data set. And it's just a bunch of uh, images of handwritten digits. Okay? And what I'm trying to do is look at each one of those images, which is actually a 28 by 28 and the actual data set. And I want to know if this is a 3 or a 1 or a 4. I'm just trying to figure out what the number is. Okay? And I'm going to do the same for each one of those. So now, um, I'm going to share this website with you guys. But basically what I'm doing is I'm using neural networks to solve this problem of <coughs> classification. And if you pay attention to uh, this side right here, it's labeled loss because the neural network is actually getting trained. So it's, we're passing it this data. We're looking at the, uh, how good the output or the, um, or the results are. And then we're tweaking it so that it gets better and better at classifying these handwritten digits. Okay, so you'll notice that we start with a large loss, and then it starts dropping towards the end. And eventually, if we keep it, we uh, keep it running for uh, enough time, the loss is going to become zero, or it's going to get, it's going to start approaching zero. But what exactly is it doing? Well, I mentioned how we need to pass it each one of those images of handwritten digits. Well, let's say we do that for each one of them, right? So we have the two, the three the neural network is going to try to analyze the image, just like we do. So because if we look at an image of a tree or a dog, we're trying to identify the parts of that object, right? So that we can make sense of it, right? So if we look at a tree and then we see leaves and we see um, trunk, we know that it's a tree. That's how we identify it, by trying to analyze each one of its parts. Well, the neural network is actually doing that. It's actually looking at uh, edges and it's looking at different changes in colors in each one of the pixels. And then based on that, it's going to be able to tell me with some certainty whether, uh, what the actual uh, number of that image is. So here's some of the results that we have. And in this situation, when we have the number nine as an image, it's actually showing me with a lot of certainty that this is most likely a nine. Now, it is still telling me with some uh, degree of certainty that is a different number, but we're just going to take the, the highest value as the answer. Okay? So this is basically how um, we can use a neural network to do something like classification with the MNIST dataset. I'm not going to go into the details of how it's doing it, but if you guys want to look it up, uh, I mean, the link is going to be in there, and you can just like learn more about it. So let's go back to this. Now, how do we get started with machine learning? There's a lot of information out there. Um, I'm going to share just my experience with machine learning, how is it that I got started, and um, hopefully that gives you uh, some insight. But um, I started taking classes here at UCI, uh, and I mean, before I even chose my specialization, I didn't know, about, I didn't know much about machine learning. Uh, once I chose my specialization of intelligent systems, I started looking more into what AI is, right? And then my first class here was 171 with Alex Eiler. Has anyone had that professor? No? Okay. Well, if you do, have fun. Um, <laughs> he's very mathematical. I mean, the way that he teaches, um, his content is very dense. Uh, but you definitely learn a lot. So I took 171, which is Introduction to Artificial Intelligence. Uh, then I took the Introduction to Machine Learning class uh, with Alex as well. And my last class in machine learning was the project class for machine learning. And that's the one where actually I feel like I learned the most. 
just because I had to choose a problem and I chose to work with neural networks and with something called generative adversarial networks. So that's a mouthful. But basically what the project was about was um, creating realistic fake images. Realistic looking uh, fake images, basically. So the way that it works is we have this thing called a generator and another thing called a discriminator. And the generator is going to get really good at creating realistic looking images and the discriminator is going to get really good at telling whether an image is fake or real. So the way that they kind of uh, help each other, they train each other, is they're going to fight against each other. One of them is going to get really good at faking images. The other one is, getting, is going to get really good at telling whether an image is fake or not. And eventually, once the generator gets really good, we're just going to throw away the discriminator. Because now we have a tool that is able to create realistic looking images, pixel by <coughs> pixel, out of nothing. Right? So we, we pass it a lot of data, let's say, about trees. And it's able to learn from these images. But later on, when I ask my neural network, can you give me a tree? It's going to be able to do that. But it's not going to just give me a tree from one that it has seen before, but it's going to create it pixel by pixel based on the information that it has learned uh, through the training. So I, I thought that was really interesting. And um, you know, after that project, I felt like I wanted to learn more about machine learning. So I've been doing just projects on my own and just reading articles. But for me, the biggest thing was finding a reason to learn. So once I did that project, I felt like there was you know, something there for me. And I, I feel like I needed to just learn more about that topic. Because there's a lot of useful things that you can do with machine learning or AI in general. Um, that's why I brought up the whole, uh, all the list of disciplines that are, have contributed to AI because you know, um, AI doesn't just apply to the internet. You can apply it to agriculture. You can apply it to marketing and different things. So um, I guess my biggest advice is just find a reason to learn. Now, I have some resources here. Does anyone know who that guy is in the corner? His name is Andrew Ong. And he is a gangster in artificial intelligence. Uh, no, he is. Um, He's a very important person in, in, in the world of artificial intelligence. He is the founder of Coursera, and he's also, I believe, with uh, Google right now, with Google DeepMind, working on different problems. But uh, he's also a professor at Stanford, so he teaches a lot of classes on artificial intelligence and machine learning, and the courses are free online. They, uh, you can find that. Now, I highly recommend that you look him up, because if you're interested, he is really good at explaining difficult concepts uh, in, in an easy way. Another guy that I admire is uh, that guy over there. His name is Sirat Chirval. He has a YouTube channel and he just talks about you know, different topics in AI. And he's very hands-on. So he teaches you how to code uh, different things. Uh, so for example, I learned how to code a neural network with TensorFlow uh, by watching his videos because that, they don't teach you that in the machine learning classes. So there's a lot of resources out there. Another one that is really good is Two Minute Papers on YouTube. Um, there's a lot of research papers that are coming out um, all the time, just because AI is such a hot topic right now. And everyone wants to contribute to it. Everyone has ideas. So, but it's hard to just <coughs> sit through a three-page, five-page uh, research papers and then try to go through all this difficult, uh, you know, difficult terminology. So. That channel actually takes a research paper and it condenses it into a two minute video. And it does a really good job of doing that. So if you just wanna know what's, what's hot in artificial intelligence, what new research is out there, watch his uh, YouTube channel because he has a lot of uh, information. Also, um, GitHub. GitHub is a great way to just learn about machine learning. So you can go in there, look up some technique for machine learning and look, look up the code. Um, try to learn from the code. Um, because like that is the best way to do it. I mean, you can watch a video, you can like take an online class, but it's not until you actually do it and get some errors and like you know uh, run into some problems that you're actually going to understand the topic. So now I want to just open up to uh, to questions and answers. Um, I f I hope that you guys have a lot of questions because I've kept this presentation very simple, very high level. So just ask me anything. It can be related to what I just talked about, or it can be something that you have you're probably interested in that I didn't mention. So I'll wait for questions.
Yeah. Uh, at the very beginning, there was a slide on how then that AI can like was contributed to by many different fields of study. Mm -hmm. And the very first item on that list was philosophy. Mm -hmm. So can you explain that connection? Yeah. So how how does philosophy um, how does philosophy contribute to artificial intelligence? I mean, well, for, for thousands of years, people have wondered what is intelligence? What makes us humans so unique, right? So superior to other animals. So I feel like the, the idea of creating, of taking human intelligence and applying it to machines or creating this intelligence has been around for many years. And so all those questions that philosophers have posed for thousands of years have actually um, being asked by scientists nowadays, like in, in artificial intelligence, right? And it's interesting because um, I also mentioned other fields like um, neuroscience. Well, when we're talking about neural networks, the whole idea of neural networks was inspired by how the brain works, by how neurons communicate with each other in our brain, right? So that whole idea was. Uh, an inspiration for creating neural networks. And actually, neural networks are one of the, the best ways to solve a lot of problems in, in machine learning right now. We're using it for object recognition, um, to understand text, and generative <laughs> neural networks. Right? I mentioned we have two neural networks fighting each other to create fake images. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, what language? You said you coded a program mm -hmm. watching us, Siraj, right? Uh, what language is it in? Because I heard most AI and machine learning programs are coded in Python. Yeah. Is that true? So if you guys didn't ask a question, I was going to oh, yeah. ask it myself or just bring it up. So best programming language for machine learning, Python. I'm sorry, Python haters. <laughs> That's what it is. It's just easy to use. It's easy to uh, prototype you know, machine learning models using Python. Of course, once you're ready to deploy, your program or maybe put it into an app or something else, you're not going to use Python. It's just not efficient. But most of your prototyping, most of your uh, uh, practice, whatever you're doing with machine learning is going to be done in Python. Yeah. Uh, although there's uh, other languages like R um, that are more scientific, and you can also use MATLAB. So, but Python is the main language that we use for machine learning. Yeah. Um, is there a lot of math involved? And like, if so, um, what kind of math are you expected to <coughs> encounter? Yeah, um, yeah, I, there's a lot of math involved. <laughs> um, I mean, why, why should you code it, right? Because there is, um, you definitely need to know calculus, some calculus, to, uh, to effectively use certain algorithms. Uh, you need statistics and probability. So with calculus, for example, there's a technique called gradient descent, and I'm not going to go too much into it, but when you are training your neural network and uh, you get a result, you're going to check whether the result is good or bad. And then based on that, you're going to try to minimize that result. Like I showed you an example. Notice how you, I, you guys saw how the loss was decreasing on the, on the graph. Well, we're actually using uh, calculus to do that. So we're taking derivatives and we're finding the minimum to uh, de uh, minimize the loss. And, in our neural network. With statistics and probability, um, again, going back to that demo of the MNIST data set, we need to um, output how the probability of how likely it is for an image to be a certain number. So, and I mean, again, you need to know how to plot different things and visualize your data. So, yeah, statistics and probability is a big thing in artificial intelligence, or machine learning, more specifically. I have a question. Or right, I have one. Uh, what is the difference between machine learning and deep learning? Have you guys heard of deep learning? Yeah. Okay, so that's another hot word. Um, uh, deep learning is a technique for implementing uh, machine learning. It's not a separate field. It's not a separate topic. Um, deep learning is just concerned with layer learning features and tasks from data. So. Um, usually, if you, I mean, if you look up what deep learning is, most likely you're going to find an answer related to neural networks. Um, and it's not, although it's not the same, um, the main 
algorithm or architecture that we use for doing deep learning <coughs> is uh, neural networks. And uh, the reason you're hearing about a lot, a lot about deep learning is because now computers are a lot more powerful. We're not just relying on CPUs. We have GPUs that can do computations really fast. And we also have a lot of data, right? So a lot of people are collecting data from the internet and using it to teach their, their machine learning programs to do something, you know, something cool. So deep learning is just um, a way of doing machine learning. What kind of stuff do you work on now that you're done with all the AI courses here? Um, so I mentioned uh, natural language processing. So I'm interested in just understanding text and the context within a, a document or a piece of text. So what I'm working on is, um, so let me give you an example. Um, I mean, the, have you guys heard of Philip DeFranco on YouTube? OK, so I watch Philip DeFranco a lot because that's how I get my news just because I, can't, I don't trust other sources. But um, in his channel, he talks about different, uh, different news. And he's always asking the audience, what do you guys think about this topic? Or what do you guys think about you know, what happened in exploits? Well, how do you go through all those comments and get an idea of what people are talking about or what people feel, about, feel like you know, uh, on a certain topic? If there are hundreds of thousands of comments, right? It's impossible. You need a lot of manpower. And even if you had a lot of people reading comments for you, it's just it will take too long. So what I'm working on right now is how to take all of those comments, pass it through uh, a machine learning model, and try to understand what people are talking about so I can filter out the comments by topics. So that you can actually look up, well, uh, war or something else, and then just easily find the comments that are related to that topic. And it's, in, it's funny because like, when I was coming up with this idea, uh, it was around the time uh, Google had the Google I.O. event. And I was watching that, and I saw that, that YouTube was planning to come up with something like that. Was something, uh, they were planning to put out like, a feature like that for YouTube. Um, they haven't done that yet. It's in beta. But I mean, it is something that you can use machine learning for, just understanding text and classifying it or filtering it so you can uh, better visualize it or, or understand it. Yeah, so that's, that's what I'm working on right now. Any other questions? I have a question for you guys. So why are you here? Are you just here because you're curious about AI or you're planning to take classes? Um, are you working on a project right now? Can someone uh, share their motivation for being here? Yeah. Uh, I'm a cognitive science major, but hopefully in grad school I'm trying to go into artificial intelligence. I'm more focused on the theoretical side of AI than the uh, applications. So mostly like looking into research or? Uh, more on like the basis of cognitive uh, well, cognition okay. and then trying to implement that within you know, artificial intelligence. Okay. Cool. But I just thought it was really cool So like that there's something on campus talking about AI mm -hmm. as a separate standalone subject. So that's <laughs> All right. Anyone else wants to share? Yeah. Um, I'm working in an, an, in an analysis, um, analytics uh, startup in Irvine, mm -hmm. and uh, we are looking into using AI, uh, AI and machine learning um, uh, uh, for, to make a recommendation system. Mm -hmm. So I'm very interested in, in the application of, of AI cool. machine learning. Yeah, actually a lot of companies are doing that right now. They want to use machine learning to better their services and, and you know, come up with better predictions or whatever it is they're doing. Um, I'm curious if you guys have heard of uh, DeepMind, or I'm sorry, uh, OpenAI. OpenAI, okay, so recently OpenAI uh, put out their results for the game Dodo, I think. I'm not a gamer, so I don't know if I'm, okay, so the game Dodo. So basically they created a player that is able to be one of the best players in that game. Uh, and it's not an easy game, I mean, even if you compare it to chess, that is a very complex game, Dota has a lot more to it. So that is a big thing right now in AI, how it is able to create this player, this artificial player, and it can compete against humans and just do so much better than them. So that is something that's really cool. And for that specific problem, um, what they're using, I, I believe, is uh, reinforcement learning. Have you guys heard of reinforcement learning? So if you're a gamer, if you're interested in creating things, uh, using AI for gaming, Reinforcement learning is the thing that you want to look into. Um, that is how you learn by trial and error, so you can create a player in a world, and maybe you want to uh, 
make it go from point A to point B without dying, right? So you can use reinforcement learning so it can start walking through the, through the world, and if it dies, it's going to receive a negative um, input or a negative score. So it's going to do it again <laughs> and over and over again until it can actually find the best way possible to get to that destination. So reinforcement learning is a big thing right now. Any other questions? I was hoping you guys have more questions. Because I kept it so like high level. Maybe, I, I mean, was there something that you guys didn't understand from my presentation that you guys want me to go back to and just kind of explain again? Or was everything so clear? Like, I feel like I, I don't feel like I did that good of a job. <laughs> okay, well, um, again, I'm going to try to share this with you guys. Uh, those are the sources that I use. I use uh, some of the slides from Professor Eilers to, uh, to put this presentation together. So that one is very mathematical and very abstract. So if you want to look into it, be my guest. And um, what else? This one is one of my favorites. Machine, uh, machine learning is fun. It's a medium article that is, I think, eight parts. But if you go through the first and second part, you're going to get a good idea of what machine learning is in more detail. Okay. So um, again, you'll get this presentation. And if you want to connect with me, feel free to send me a message through LinkedIn. But I'll be here for a few more minutes if you guys want to come up and ask questions or just talk about random stuff. OK? Oh, you have a question? Yeah. Do you have to be like super smart to get into it? <laughs> <laughs> to get into to learn it or to get into the class? Like to get into machine learning. To get into the class, you just have to pay. But <laughs> to get into machine learning, no. I I, I don't think so. No. I mean, so you know, it's like anything else. It's like anything where you have to. Uh, you're gonna try to learn it, and you're gonna find your weaknesses, and you're gonna have to work on that on those. For me, I feel like I hate statistics and probability, so I just hate having to plot my data and visualize it and then make sense of like my losses and all those things. But it's so important because if I don't use those techniques, I'm not going to be able to uh, get good results in my projects, right? So I mean, if you're good at calculus or if you've taken calculus, you know, you might understand those sections where you have to use, uh, take derivatives and do things like that. But maybe if you're not that good at statistics, you're going to have to work on that. So I mean, it's, it's like anything else. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you worked on any like research projects related to AI? Uh, no, I, I feel like the closest I've come to research is just doing my project class, the 175 class. Um, so last two nights ago, I did a, this a presentation on introduction to neural networks with a friend. Her name is Katie. Katie Boy, I think that's how you pronounce her name. She's a uh, Microsoft partner, so she's running the Microsoft at UCI club. She's done research and she's actually doing research right now with Professor Eiler. So um, look her up. She's she's really good. And I mean, she has a lot of uh, uh, experience in AI too. Yeah. But I haven't. I'm honestly, I mean, I'm just, I'm about to graduate. So I'm just looking into applying this into more like practical applications rather than going to research. But maybe, maybe later on I'll, I'll go back to school. So you, you graduated with a BS, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you and you're optimistic about it? Like can you do something with the BS or well, I oh, have yeah, to yeah. Get oh yeah, I'm I'm pretty optimistic. <laughs> yeah. I I mean I don't know if I'm being naive, being optimistic, but no, I, I'm pretty optimistic about it just because um, so I did this uh, a couple months ago. I went to uh, the Bay Area and I just went for networking. I just wanted to meet some people. So I, I messaged a lot of people, or my connections on LinkedIn, that work at you know whatever companies that I want to work at. And I, I told them, like, hey, can we meet and just talk about your work and you know just chat in general. So I got to meet with a lot of them, a lot of my connections that I haven't met. Uh, some people that work at LinkedIn, um, other company called Plat, I believe. So, and they told me what they do, and most of them started as just a software engineer, but they, since the company started implementing more machine learning into their services, they kind of started learning more about machine learning. And there was a transition, an easy transition to go from just developing applications to actually applying machine learning techniques to the, their software. So, um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, I don't necessarily just want to work as a software developer, I want to do machine learning engineering, but I know that there is, right now, it's like a <coughs> topic and a lot of companies are using it, so 
there is going to be a way to just apply it, even if you're just hired as a software developer. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, guys.